last time we were together, we talked about some of the industry challenges in the equine industry. And, you know, whether you talk about urbanization and, and just what's happening in my area in terms of urban sprawl, sprawl, you talk about the aging of your membership in AQHA, not unlike that in all of agriculture. We speak about industry fragmentation and the number of associations that have been created that have, have really caused this membership base to, to shrink a bit. We talk about competition from alternative sports and activities and kids getting so deeply engaged that they just can't hardly have time for any livestock projects. We talked about the image of elitism that um, sometimes occurs in, uh, in the livestock industry and more importantly in the horse industry. Um, sometimes the, the, the black eye we get from bad actors from an animal rights and, and humane standpoint and certainly um, I'm not, um, uh, you know, unaware of the industry consolidation that has occurred. I tell people that as we think about the animal health companies and the seed companies uh, that I work with, there was a time when Asgro and DeKalb and Monsanto were three separate clients of mine and they're all one now. So, so, so that's happening in the equine industry as well. And I think the results are very simply this. We, we've seen a decline in registration. Craig's going to talk to you about that, and I hope it's uh, flattening out. Certainly, we've, we've struggled from a membership standpoint. Um, we've seen a decrease in youth involvement as this sport gets so expensive, and again, the time constraints on young people get so extreme. Um, we see continued industry fragmentation, and not unlike churches, uh, people creating their own segments and their own associations to do their own thing and, 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 and try to serve a, a separate group of, uh, and segment of customers. We've seen a decline in corporate sponsorship. The fact of the matter is that uh, these corporations, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I certainly have in some organizations that I work with, that um, you know, when two organizations merge, they typically don't spend as much as both organizations were before. That's some of the efficiencies they promised their shareholders. It makes it difficult for organizations like yours. And then certainly we continue, all of us in agriculture and livestock industry, to have attacks from, from NGOs. Let me tell you this. The good news is you're not alone. <laughs> how, how would you like to be in the taxi business these days? Or, or, or maybe some of you, and Ralph, I know you are, the car business, automobile business. Yeah, well, I, I should have thought about that. That's right, let me just move right along there. Get, get, get rid of that doggone uh, Chevy. Let, let me point your attention to a couple, and by the way, let, let me just see by show of hands. How many of you took a taxi here from the airport? Did anybody take an Uber here from the airport? Yeah, okay, well, we're gonna have a discussion about that. Notice this, in Chicago, cabbies have seen their revenue slide for the long beleaguered industry by 40% over the last three years. Uh, number of riders in Chicago hailing a cab has plummeted from 2.3 to 1.1. In New York, ridership of the iconic yellow cab, you think of New York City, you think of the yellow cab, uh, has fallen 30% over just three years. San Francisco, home of Uber, right? Um, the, the cab company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And Los Angeles found taxi ridership falling nearly 50%. So what am I saying here? Uber came in, disrupted the industry in a big way, right? Founded in 2009 operates in over 425 cities around the world. And, and, and here's the essence that we got to recognize. There are a whole generation of people who say, you know what, I don't need to own something as long as I can have access to it. And they act that way in terms of automobiles. That's why they stay with VRBO online. I mean, the hotel industry is facing the same kind of challenge. It's a fundamentally different concept by a different set of people. Interestingly enough, Uber is not just after the taxi industry, are they? They are looking for what ride hailing means to the entire world. And, and I want you to point out a couple of key comments there. According to the OECD study, shared autonomous vehicles could reduce the number of cars needed by 80 to 90 percent. Today, ride hailing only accounts for 4 percent. It's expected to account for nearly 25 percent, especially in large city centers. Here's the point. There's massive disruption, and the question you have to ask yourself is how are taxi companies and automobile companies and dealerships and, and transit businesses going to adopt to a world of Uber and Lyft and a world where a set of demographics, particularly the millennials, think differently about asset ownership? How about this one? The industry I'm in, in the food industry, agribusiness industry, this rocked the world when Amazon announced their $13.7 billion purchase of Whole Foods, or what some people call Whole Paycheck, right? The fact of the matter is, 
We are experiencing an Amazoning of America, are we not? How many of you are Amazon Prime members? Amazon Prime, I am too. Get spoiled by it, don't you? I may tell you, two days, it's in Kersey, America. Amazon acquired those 460 stores, but here's the deal. Those stores only represent 2% of the overall grocery market. But guess what Amazon can do with those stores? They can turn them into virtual warehouses and they can have reach and spread to their millions of Amazon customers all across the country. About 12% of US grocery shoppers brought their groceries online in 2016. And so you say, well, that's not that big a market, but where is it headed, right? Younger generations, what are they saying? They're absolutely all over it, and they're willing to pay a fee for that. In fact, earlier this month, Amazon announced that for $7.99, there are three markets right now that you can guarantee your groceries delivered to your house within two hours as long as you spend more than, I think it was 35 or 50 bucks. This is going to fundamentally change the grocery industry. Amazon gets that the real golden jewel in retail is grocery. And if they can secure that, this thing's gonna get a whole lot bigger. So the question for them is how will grocery stores, restaurants, and food delivery businesses transform themselves to be able to compete against a company that, look at those words, has a very strong digital presence, a large loyal customer base, and guess what else? Incredible insights about who those customers are, how they shop, when they shop, what they like. How many of you have been prompted by Amazon to say if you bought a tent, Kevin, for graduation two years ago, here's four things you might want this May. They're incredible about it. We can learn something from there. So here's a couple steps I want to challenge you with. Step one, confronting reality. If you've not read this book, it's a great book. And it suggests this, to confront reality is to recognize the world as it is, not as you wish it to be. And to have the courage to do what must be done, not just what you'd like to do. That's a tough pill to swallow for all of us. Whether in the horse business, the cattle business, Dr. Hurd's daughter's in the machinery business. I do a fair bit of work in the machinery business. I guarantee you, agriculture machinery is not a particularly fun place to be right now in this kind of agricultural economy. And yet, many companies are being forced with the challenge of facing reality and having the courage to do what must be done, not what you'd just like to do. The second thing we have to do, and I want to challenge you today, is we have to make a choice. Right? We gotta, you, you, we gotta be willing to change. And when change hits us, we have two options. We can choose to deny that it's actually going to happen, that it's going to be a long-term change. We can delay making decisions saying, you know, we just want things to be the way they used to be, and if we wait long enough, this is just a passing fad and things will get back to the good old days. And ultimately, those organizations typically go into decline. Or we can choose to define how the world is changing around us, make some concrete decisions about what we're going to do differently, how we're going to behave, and the decisions we have to make, and then deploy the kinds of assets we need to deploy in terms of dollars and cents and people and talent to make that positive and constructive change. Does that make sense? So today, we're going to talk a little bit about transforming AQHA. We're going to begin with a discussion by your current president about their commitment to engaging members in this change process. We're going to hear Challenge 2018, something you'll be hearing a lot about throughout the next year by your executive vice president. We'll spend some time talking uh, uh, from, or hearing from our first vice president, Dr. Jim Hurd, about the role of transformation and innovation. And I've seen him lead that change firsthand all the way back to my years at CSU. We're gonna talk uh, about and, and, and ask some people to, to, to share their experiences that not only know your world in the equine industry, but they've had some real life experience in some major companies in transformation efforts. We're gonna hear from them. We're gonna have a chance to engage with them. So let's get started. And, and I wanna tell you, just like last time, we value your involvement. We want to use these little clickers to, uh, to keep this somewhat engaging this afternoon. And I want to ask you uh, the first question up here. Hold on just a second. So this is, uh, all right, now we can go back. Fantastic. So I want you to just as a first blush, we want to get your reaction to this. Um, complete the following statement. I believe most state and national leaders in AQHA 
recognize the need for transformational change and support organizational decisions and investments that will position AQHA as a leader in revitalizing the equine industry, or B, recognize the need for some minor tweaks and changes but are uncomfortable and unsupportive of radical change, or C, they understand that some of the industry trends but, but they lack the sense of urgency or understanding of why change is necessary and the risks to the organization and industry of not making substantial change, or D, they are absolutely oblivious to external trends impacting our business and feel very comfortable with the status quo. Go ahead and select your responses. You can only respond once. <laughs> this isn't Chicago. <laughs> Sorry about that. Vote early and vote often. But I don't guarantee there won't be any Russian collusion here. So uh, we, 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 we have not, uh, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be, uh, drive us right into the political fray right now, all right? 109 responses, what else do we have? A few more final votes, keep going. Any more? All in, all done. And we are closed. So what do we say here? Looks like 47% or 47 of you said, um, nope. understand some of the industry trends but lack a sense of urgency or understanding of why change is necessary followed by the fact that they do recognize the need and, um, and support organizational decisions. And then in number three, number B, which is our item B, recognize the need for some minor tweaks or changes but are uncomfortable. I think that speaks largely to, to, to the task of this afternoon, Craig, and, and, and why you and your leadership team said we, we need to have this meeting because this group becomes the disciples that head out there and helps the organization create the burning platform, helps create a sense of urgency around changing. I was told many years ago there's a difference between urgency and crisis. And, and, and if you have a car, if you're in a car and you're driving down the road 75 miles an hour and there's a brick wall exactly a quarter mile ahead of you, that's an urgent situation. You need to be thinking and doing something rather quickly. When you're going down the road 75 miles an hour and you have a brick wall 50 feet in front of you, that's a crisis. There's not much you can do about it. And he said the challenge of leadership is making that brick wall seem just a little closer than it actually is. The challenge of leadership is creating a sense of urgency before your organization endures a sense of crisis. And I want to tell you, when your organization gets into a sense of crisis, there's no fun about that, right? So if you can create a sense of urgency and help people see the need for some of this change, that's an incredibly important role for you as a leader. Next question. So membership as a whole. Last question was about leaders. Membership as a whole. How open are AQHA members? Hold on just a second. Oh, there it is. Now it's open. How open are AQHA members to change? A, <coughs> AQHA members are very open and ready for change. B, AQHA members would welcome changes that result in better and faster member services, but may not be supportive of any other changes. So those that benefit me directly and I get better service, great, but no others. AQHA members are open to change provided it doesn't require them to change what they do or how they interact with the association. You can change just as long as I don't have to. AQHA members are satisfied with the status quo and see no need for organizational change. Or E, AQHA members will resist change, especially if it takes resources away from existing programs and activities. Make your votes known. Or nine, ten, just about. There was about 115 the last time. Look at that, 117. We got more folks coming in. All right, all in, all done. And the verdict says, all right, so from a membership standpoint, again, open to change provided it doesn't require them to change what they do or how they interact with the association. Followed by, <coughs> would welcome changes result in better, faster service, maybe not some of the other changes. All right, and um, certainly a, a small majority or a small percentage, 20 folks, AQHA members are very open and ready for organizational change. And then there were uh, 16, and, and I think item E is an important one. 
Um, you talk to anybody, and I bet our panelists are going to talk, tell us that this afternoon, that there will be a segment of your membership that always resists change, right? We've all heard the story. The only person who likes change is the baby with a wet diaper, right? I mean, fundamentally, you're always going to have a segment of any membership that says, I want things to be the way they used to be. And I think the process and the management of these kind of change processes is, can we overcome the resistance that we know will come from, again, probably 10, 12, 15% of our membership? Last question before we get on with the day. Uh, rank the top three areas. We want your impressions and opinions about um, where transformational change is most needed in the equine industry. Uh, the way we market our organization activities, the way we communicate with our members, the way we collect and utilize member information to improve our service, the way we use technology to become more efficient, the way we manage data, the way we work with other entities and organizations in a collaboration to grow our industry, the way we deliver value to sponsors and allied industry, or other. It's going to be tough to select just one, but we made that uh, that way purposefully because, quite honestly, uh, we want a forced choice tool. If you have to select the, the, the most important, the, the area that most transformational change is needed, which one of those would you select? Ninety-one. All right, it looks like about a hundred and twenty. All in? All right. And survey says, item F, the way we work with other entities and organizations in a collaboration to grow our industry. Interesting. Interesting. And then D comes in second, the way we use technology to become more efficient and effective. Um, I want to tell you, as a, uh, as a cattle breeder, um, I love the uh, digital beef system that our breed association is on, and, and it has absolutely made my life easier and better, um, and, and, and I think has made the association more effective. So I think there's lots of opportunities there. You, you all are doing your own initiatives in that area. And then kind of a tie between the top three, the way we market, the way we communicate with members, the way we collect and utilize member information. Um, but, but I think that's interesting. The number one way is the way we work with other entities and organization, and we need to think differently about how we do that. That's great. Thank you guys for, for, for uh, giving us this, this information. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, John Cotter uh, is a, a well-known, a well-respected um, author and uh, consultant uh, that speaks to the whole issue of both leadership but more importantly, change management transformation. And I love this quote. He said, what leaders really do is prepare an organization for change and help them cope as they struggle through it. And ladies and gentlemen, we have one of those leaders with us today. It's my pleasure to introduce you uh, to uh, a, a very uh, influential man within the quarter horse industry. Uh, he is your current AQHA president. Ralph Seekins comes to us all the way from Fairbanks, Alaska, and he was just saying down there that you, only had a, you only had a couple days under 35 degrees below, is that right, this year? Sure. Pretty amazing. Again, you all know the achievements that uh, the Seekins family has, has had in this uh, industry, in this organization. He's been a director since 2006 served on the Marketing and Membership Committee, the Foundation Council, and the Public Policy Committee. Would you please put a warm welcome to your president, Ralph Seekin. Thank you. You may notice I'm not wearing a tie and everybody else is. That's because you need to know the real Ralph Seekins. You know, <laughs> he doesn't really like to wear neckties that much. I'm a used car salesman, you know, and uh, we try to, as the Apostle Paul once said, we try to be all things to all people so we may be able to win a few. And in the car business, we have to adapt. One of the things I found out, though, having been a Ford dealer now for 40 years, getting into the automobile industry by accident to get my wife through nursing school in a temporary job that is still a temporary job for me, I guess, is that every day we have to get up in the morning and figure out what's different and how do we adapt to it? What do we have to do to change, if anything, in order to be, stay competitive? It's, it's an important thing. 
And what we did last year isn't as important as what are we going to do today. And uh, I, for an example, uh, our dealership in 2005 was uh, unbelievably ex uh, chosen from over 20,000 dealerships nationwide by the, in the National Automobile Dealer Association to be the Time Magazine Quality Dealer of the Year. It's like winning the Super Bowl in the car industry. But that was 12 years ago. That was 12 years ago. If we'd have stayed doing what we did 12 years ago, we wouldn't be in business today. Because things change, and they change rapidly, and we have to adapt to them. You know, uh, and a lot of people for thousands of years have said, you know, make sure that you're listening to what needs to be done. If I could uh, just, there was a guy that wrote several thousand years ago, he said, uh, plans go wrong for the lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. And a friend of mine who I went to college with wrote a commentary based on that. And he said, and let me read this to you. People with tunnel vision, those locked into one way of thinking, are likely to miss the right road because they've closed their minds to new options. We need the help of those who can enlarge our vision and broaden our perspective. Seek out the advice of those who you know and know you and have a wealth of experience. Build a network of advisors. Then be open to new ideas and be willing to weigh their suggestions carefully. Your plans will be stronger and more likely to succeed. One of the things for the last several years that we on the executive committee have emphasized is asking you to talk to us, to become our advisors so that we can carefully consider your input, your wisdom, your experience, so that we can make decisions based on your wise advice. I cannot tell you how important that is. When someone is elected to the executive committee, we come in and we go, now what do I do? Now what do I do? And pretty soon we learn, and we learn quickly, that the best thing we can do is listen to you and encourage you to speak to us. We cannot hear you until you do speak to us. And I think, I hope, you have noticed that over the last several years, your upper management, your executive committee, have been out there among you asking for your advice. What do you think? How would you approach this situation? And I think that's going to continue. So as we go into this convention, and as we get ready to hear from Craig, for an example, who came to us, what now, three years, Craig? Three years ago, and came in there from the cattle industry and found out what it's like to work with 250,000 advisors, some of whom never talked to us, but walk away because they're mad at us, but we didn't know why they were mad at us, uh, you know, and, and, but he's found out that you folks out there sitting in this audience today and all around the world, and there are some of you from all around the world, that you are a wealth of experience that we need to listen to so that as we make these fundamental transformations, not redo everything, but we walk away from the old, well, this is the way AQHA does it, and that's the way it's going to be attitude, that we look forward to how we can become more competitive, a better service-driven organization for you and for what you need out there. So it really is an honor for me to be able to stand here as a used car salesman and introduce someone who has in, he's injected a spirit of we can do it into AQHA through the last three years. 
And that's my friend and your friend and our executive vice president, Craig Huffines. Craig, come on up. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, working with this executive committee and with Ralph and, um, and, and tackling some of the challenges that y'all are all aware of um, and are helping us uh, to network uh, and to understand, you know, how we can move this organization forward. Um, you know, I've been great friends with my, my buddy Kevin over here uh, for, for many years, going back to college. And um, it's fun to get on stage with Kevin, Kevin being a consultant in the ag community, working with the Masanos of the world. Uh, he's, he, he served with us a couple of different rounds of strategic planning at the Hereford Association. but. But one thing that we have seen, Kevin, is that change is inevitable. And, uh, and, and in your position, you've seen many, many companies turn around very rapidly uh, their trend line. And so today, uh, that is our mission uh, as an organization. You've spent your hard-earned money to come to Jacksonville, Florida to engage and participate as leaders of this great industry. Uh, this morning, we already had some focus groups and we're gonna talk a little bit this afternoon about what we might be learning from those focus groups. So as Ralph so eloquently spoke, we are listen, wanting to listen to you and we're wanting to engage with you because having that understanding is gonna help us as we move forward. Let's go ahead and move to the slides. And I wanna to talk to you about what's happening in the office. There we go. I knew you'd come through for me, Kev. That. I left it up you betcha. Uh, so let's talk about transformation. There's a number of areas and pain points as a member uh, that you probably think about periodically during the course of a year uh, when you engage with your organization AQHA. Maybe that's a time of the year when you're registering foals. Uh, maybe that's a time of the year where you're getting ready to go into show season and you want to know where your level is. You want to understand, okay, where's my horse on this and where's, where am I on this? And how do I find out where I am? Or perhaps it's, okay, I want to uh, register uh, at World Show. I want, I, want to, uh, I want to get enrolled here at World Show. And you know, that's kind of a hassle. I've got to wait for the paperwork to come through. And how quickly is it when you get your paperwork back through the, through the process of snail mail? So these are just a few examples of some of the things that create pain points uh, and that we're working on uh, trying to modernize. And of course, we need your input. So here's just a few key things of transformational focus that are ongoing within the, the office. Number one is reprioritizing our goals. And so the first thing we're, we're asking of you is, uh, what, what do you expect? of AQHA as an office, office backroom operation. Uh, what do you expect in terms of uh, being more collaborative if you're, a, if you're a partner out there, one of our alliance partners, what is your expectation? You know, we have the big database, we have the big office. Uh, what is your expectation for how we deliver to you best of service, best of class of service? We're refocusing on benchmark and metrics. So last week, you'll, you'll meet a lady here in just a few minutes, uh, Kimberly Edmonds, who's helping us with customer care and evaluating our customer care center. So she spent a week listening in on phone calls and trying to understand, okay, well, why are people calling? Why do they have to call? Would they rather do it online? Is it stuff that we could just tee up for them online and, and reduce their, uh, their, their reason for calling into, into the office? And what are we learning for you, from you this morning in terms of those needs? We want to put metrics on it. What should be an expected turnaround time from the moment a registration hits the front door or hits the computer screen and then flips and turns into a, a digital, perhaps digital registration paper that zooms right back to you within 24 to 48 hours? Improving business efficiencies. Y'all all know this, you get stuff in the mail from us every week or every other week or every month. You know, can we reduce postage and, and mailing um, and the things that get lost in the mail, particularly when we send it to Latin America or Europe, uh, where, where the mail is just simply not working for our membership uh, in those parts of the world. So what can we do to make your life easier as an international member? 
And of course, modernizing our interactions, the way that we do business with one another, whether that's digitally, whether that's through an application that has your own personal information on it, or maybe you're not a person that likes to work on the, on the iPhone. Maybe you, you want to talk to somebody. You want to talk to a person. So we're trying to identify what are the ways in which you want to, to do business with us. Um, and, and we want to tee up all of those options for you to make your life much, much easier. So we're in the middle of transformation, and our executive committee has been lighting a fire under us. I can remember in, a, in an EC meeting last September when Butch Weiss stood up and says, I want to see some urgency. Uh, and he meant it. And he meant it. And we get the message. And so we are in that urgent kind of a mode of how do we get caught up with 20 years of technology debt and get it to a point where y'all are satisfied. Now, will we be Amazon speed? I'm not sure yet. I'm not going to promise that. But we certainly have a goal to try to be, meet that expectation. So here are some of the T's. The six T's, are the, which are the vehicles of AQHA transformation. Number one is thought. We have to put some thought into this. So, so where are those areas that we can get some quick wins and turn some things around for you very quickly? Technology, we've talked about it. Technology is changing our, our world. It's changing the way we do business. Most of us bank electronically. Most of us pay our bills electronically. Not very many of us keep a hand checkbook anymore and keep our balance by hand. It's done electronically. So what are the things that we can do from a technology standpoint that will allow you to turn in your SBR reports electronically, to pull up your mayor inventory, uh, to transfer animals? You know, what are those things that we can use technology-wise to do that? What, what are the things that we can do from a care center standpoint? Can we create a cloud-based technology where perhaps we can have reps in Europe or in Latin America on different time zones that can provide service? We're talking about training and skill sets. How do we get our folks up to speed from a training and skill set standpoint so they can create these deliverables uh, that we are aspiring to deliver in the next year to two years. And then touch points. We talked about how we talk to you, how we communicate with you, either through email or through electronic chat, or maybe it's after hours phone call system, some, some way to call in and get information in the evenings. But what are the various ways on your time schedule can we touch you? And then transparency. I'm going to talk to you today about the struggles. I mean, we're having some uh, technology transformation is not, is not an easy task. And of course, we've been talking about 4.0, the database, for, for going on, what, three to five years before I got here even. Um, we're in the tail end of trying to get that basic platform up and going here, sometimes early, in, in the early summer. But from a transparency standpoint, we, we don't want to use that as an excuse anymore for delay. Yeah, we've got to get it up and going, but once we get it up and going, we're going right into phase two. And so hence, that's why we're, we're having some of these focus groups here uh, this week to talk to you about, all right, what are some of the other tools that we can build on to 4.0 to make your life easier? And finally, trust. You know, we want to be more open to you, um, provide better communication, uh, and so that you're understanding that your organization, AQHA, the AQHA brand, you can trust. And so those are our six T's that we're trying to deploy in the center of our culture back home in Amarillo. And why are we doing that? Well, let's talk a little bit about membership trends. Now, Kevin described the difference between urgency and crisis. Now, depending on who you are, uh, if you look at our trends for over the last, what, 10 years in membership, we've, we've lost 100,000 members. That today is revenue of $4 million annually. Now this is a concern. It's not quite crisis because there's opportunity in front of us, but it is urgent. It is incredibly urgent, and I'm gonna show you why. We annually lose 38,000 members a year. We bring in just under 31,000 members a year. We lose about 7,500 members annually. Now that's not a crisis, but it's urgent. Because the way I look at that is, every seven years, 
we have more past members than we have present members. And to me, that's a problem. That's telling me we're not delivering value because they're still out there. They still own a horse, Joan. They still are interested in our product. They're just not a member. And so those are the urgency kind of things that we're thinking about. How do we change that trend? And this is the opportunity pyramid. If you go straight to the top, that's our youth group. Can you see the numbers? 22, it's kind of bopping around there. 22,000 youth members. That's down about 30, from 32,000 10 years ago. The next group is our international membership, 36,000 members. There's our racing group, 46,000. Our ranch group is 97,000 members. Do y'all know that we have more ranchers that are members of the AQHA than the National Cattlemen's Beef Association? That's opportunity. That's huge opportunity for us. Recreational riders, 136 members and on down, competition owners, AQHA members, 253,000, but now look, engaged horse owners, nearly a half a million. Look how many owners there are, 800,000 horse owners. There are 1.15 folks that have friended AQHA's Facebook page. And our website, which is being remodeled, by the way, we're going to show you a little bit about that, Mike Minardi. Without the remodel, 1.55 million unique folks that touch our website on an annual basis. Okay? So, to me, that is just, it just spells out opportunity. It just spells out bringing in new folks into our business that will enhance the value of our horse and we can create opportunities to drive value back to them. That's a population of people that we can sell John Deere tractors to, Ford pickup trucks, Neutrina feed, Bank of America cards, and the list goes on and on. AQHA t-shirts. So this is what excites me about transformation. So our top five disruptive technologies by 2025, and I'm gonna tell you that we're engaged in about four of them already. This was a study done by McKinsey Global Institute. We're involved in at least four of these different technologies. One is mobile internet. Most of you all do your work on your phone, on your handheld application, uh, natural user interface, low cost storage, advanced low cost batteries, by 2025, the spend on the development of the mobile internet will be, be between four to 11 trillion. So naturally, our website is handheld device uh, mobile based so that you can search around on your iPhone. Automation of knowledge work, big data, artificial intelligence. The spend by 2025 is five, expected to be five to seven trillion. Now this is why 4.0, your database challenge, our challenge we've been dealing with for the past three years of development is so critically important. Because if the data can be accessed, if we can have all of your information in front of you, we can tee that stuff up to you guys uh, and make it very user friendly. And when you search on our website, you're gonna find out that it's gonna track what you like. That website is gonna morph into what you want on the front end. So it's gonna serve up whether you're a rancher that's breeding horses and you wanna register them, it's gonna serve that space up to you. If you're, in, if you're interested in racing, it's gonna serve that up. So it's gonna customize itself through artificial intelligence to what your needs are going to be and we're investing heavily into that. Internet of things. We've got a, a task force right now today and it's gonna come up in the stud book this week, the discussion of microchipping, radio frequency identification. Dr. Tom Lentz is helping us on a project. We're gonna be looking at some pilot projects this year. Some of you have already been helping us in uh, navigating and understanding the technology. Within a, just a few years, I can almost guarantee you, it's gonna be commonplace. And it's gonna be, dri be driven by biosecurity issues. It's gonna be driven by quick access and check-in at the shows, accurate check-in at the shows, by accurate identification of that horse that's going into that show pen, it's gonna be about consumer confidence. And at a minimal cost, you guys are gonna like this. 
So we're going to move in that direction. Cloud-based technology. We are currently looking at a phone system that's potentially cloud-based technology. What does that mean? That means that that's, that system can be accessed from anywhere in the world. That means it can link up to our big database in Amarillo. Perhaps we could have an office in Panama City, or Mexico City, or in Belgium, or in Italy, or in Australasia. Those are gonna be technologies that we can then try to really become an international organization. By 2025, the spend is somewhere gonna be between 1.5 and $6 trillion. And then advanced robotics. I saw the craziest thing in Europe the other day where they're actually exercising racehorses with some robotic train. It scared the daylights out of me. So I'm not advocating that right now. Uh, but who knows? You know, you've got your sweepers that are cleaning your house right now. Um, we're not sure whether that technology fits, but those top four guys, it's happening. It's going to be happening right now. So there's big changes in AQHA technology. We've mentioned them, the database, the website. Uh, we've started this year educational judges webinars where you, you don't have to fly to Fort Worth. We can actually deliver you that information from Amarillo. I think it was a very big success, uh, this past training uh, program that we, we held in December. Uh, we use the Blackboard tool for education. We can serve up all of this education where people can access it. And so we've even talked about an AQHA university where you can go to the website and learn about various aspects of our equestrian world. Our young people, I think, are going to enjoy that. And we think that someday there could be an international skillathon, some sort of equine skillathon, and you might be able to go find that information and those resources through Blackboard Tools of Education. And we're going to show you this afternoon a neat little tool that we call it our Uber of equine, the Uber uh, uh, leapfrogging the taxis. We're, we're, we're looking at ways in which we can serve up the barrel racing industry. Uh, so we have Michelle Hamilton and, and then also Justin Billings, uh, one of our youngsters in the show department, both working simultaneously on prototypes that are going to serve barrels and the show industry. Now we have some big aspirations for these products and we hope that, that you, you get a good, good idea of where we're headed. Uh, but we're doing focus group work. Uh, we just spent a couple of days in Fort Worth during the Patriot visiting with the uh, BBR folks about what the needs are of their industry. We are going to start talking to our show folks about what are the services that we could provide using applications to our show industry. The 4.0 project is, uh, is grinding along. Uh, we, you know, we were hoping to go live in September. Um, these things have have not met our expectation. There has been some, some major uh, challenges as we migrate to this new uh, data platform, but we are in the final two minutes of the fourth quarter. Uh, we believe that this product's gonna be up and rolling, rolling and at least final testing uh, starting in June uh, with hopefully a, a, a go live in July. We know this has been uh, delayed and delayed and delayed uh, but not unlike what major corporations go through, the, this, is, this is the basis for all the other things that we develop in the future, and we're trying to get it right. And based on what we learned last time we launched a product like this, we're not going to launch it until we absolutely are confident it's ready. We are not going to create problems uh, for our membership and for our basic service uh, that we provide you. We're going to make sure that it's debugged, it's working, and we can push work through for you. So we're hoping that's getting launched in July. Here's something that, just some quick wins. These are nothing spectacular. Uh, they're, they're just expectations that are quick wins that once we go live this summer, that are just gonna be automatic. Some things that this product will do. And for one, wouldn't it be great to pay an invoice? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't it be great just to get an, an invoice electronically, be able to go online, find out what you owe, swipe it with a, a credit card or, or a PayPal, and knock that, check that box, right? Well, this is something that, that obviously the new system will provide. Correspondence, you know, being able to send you reports back and forth electronically. Just some basic reports, being able to communicate with you and what your needs are. Uh, this is something that will be a basic expectation when we go live. Member profile, so when you get on there, you, can, you don't have to call in and say, hey, I just moved. 
I've got a new phone number, I have a new email address. No, you can go on there yourself and you can update uh, your member profile, very basic form that you can go and, and do without making a phone call into the office. And then of course, if you're registering horses and you wanna do a name search and, and, or a name reservation, wouldn't this, isn't this kinda of cool? You don't have to call in and say, well, uh, I'm gonna fax you in this spelling and you see if it's available and then reserve it for me, okay? We're not gonna, we're not gonna have to call in and do that next year. We're gonna wind up actually doing a name search and a reserve and, uh, and you can do that online. So these are just examples. These are small examples of just small little pain points that we want to evolve and jump on top of and then continue to improve. And ho, oh, how about this? An online world show entry, now isn't that novel? Uh, we can actually get on board and, and pick out your classes. Uh, you, can, uh, you can enter, enter your horse uh, and, and you can get these entries done online and you can pay online. So that's kind of a first phase of what we wanna see happen in the show world in the entry side of this. Um, and we are actually looking at how that will evolve into a full-fledged show management package down the road. Um, however long that takes, we need to get there. We need a show management package that allows the free flow of data back and forth from our show managers and quit all this data entry stuff and all this error uh, so, that, uh, so that we can make our lives easier in managing 2,900 shows and 960, 970,000 entries. Uh, we, need to, we need to automate those things. So, uh, you know, if we make these corrections and with your help and with your partnership and and certainly we beg for your patience. Uh, we believe that there's a lot more customer loyal loyalty out there to gain. You saw the pyramid. You see the number of people who own a horse. Those are quarter horses, folks. Uh, we still register 60% of all registered horses in the United States. Those are quarter horses. And those are opportunities. Those are touch point opportunities to get new folks into our business if you're a if you're a, a trainer, you're interested in finding new clients. Well, we want to find them for you. Uh, we want folks who, to do business with us. We want to provide service to them and we want to sell them things, uh, things that our corporate partners would like to, like, to, like to sell. So, caring about the quarter horse community. In review here, we're going deep on customer care. You're gonna talk, you're gonna hear about some of the customer journey work that we're doing. We're gonna to try to understand your journey as a customer of AQHA. Uh, we've just kicked out a member satisfaction survey that will give us some gap analysis of where your expectations are and where we truly are. Uh, branding redefined. In the corporate setting, you're gonna hear a little bit about our, our, our new branding initiative. It's what we're gonna preach internally to our staff. It's gonna be our commitment, our commitment to you and our commitment to our industry, and, uh, and certainly from our international folks. First, I better say thank you. Thank you for being loyal to us when we haven't delivered much, except for an awesome horse. Uh, we wanna thank you for being a part, staying hitched. In the future, we wanna map your journey with AQHA and try to create opportunities to better serve you, whatever your language might be. Uh, so with that, um, this is just a busy, busy slide about our racing lanes uh, that are currently ongoing uh, internally at AQHA. Uh, and we're hopeful by this time next year, you're gonna recognize some real benefits and some real solutions that'll be coming to fruition. So we wanna hold the vision and we wanna trust the process and we wanna move it forward uh, in a way that you'll be proud as our leadership. Uh, to be an AQHA member, and if you have ideas, if you have concerns, if you have questions, then as President Ralph Seekins said, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to talk to us. Because there's not a problem that shouldn't be at least evaluated and looked at. And that's the attitude that, uh, that we're trying to take on uh, in Amarillo. So with that, Kevin, we appreciate you, sir, for being here and uh, taking us through this journey this afternoon.
Well, thank you, Craig. And I want to tell you um, again, Craig and I, our friends, uh, friendship dates all the way back to some uh, times of being arch rivals in the livestock judging arena. Uh, but you're lucky to have that guy because uh, let me tell you this. First time I worked for the Hereford Association, uh, I want to say, Craig, it was back in 2000, first strategic plan that we did at that point in time. And uh, I just completed a strategic plan this year for the Herbert Association uh, with, with Craig's successor and uh, th that team. And, and here's what I'll tell you. Anybody that knows anything about leadership knows there's, there's two kinds of leadership. There are leaders that are able to get things done while they are there. And there are leaders that leave a legacy behind them that the organization continues to grow and change even after they're gone. And I will tell you, that guy there he clipped both of those boxes. Because not only the, the, the change that I saw in the Hereford Association in terms of the kind of the cattle, in terms of the enthusiasm the industry has for the cattle, in terms of the organization uh, that is there to support the cattle, improved dramatically from 2000 to 2015 when you left, my friend. And I want to tell you, you put the people and the processes in place that that, that association is still on an upward trajectory with some great leadership going, and, and I want to commend you for that. So, so uh, you've got a talented person there. Um, I mean that with all due respect. And next, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce another gentleman who I've known since my college days. I can't speak to his skills as a horse trainer, but I can tell you, as a trainer of young people, there's nobody that's a better mentor, a better motivator, or a better coach than Dr. Hurd. He's been an AQHA director in both Colorado and Texas. He's chaired a number of your AQHA committees. Uh, currently, he serves as executive professor and coordinator of equine initiatives at Texas A&M and also uh, holds the Dr. Glenn Bl Blodgett Equine Chair at Texas A&M. And I might add, I inform both he and Craig that I look more like an Aggie today with my tie than either of them. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please help me join, join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Hurt. <laughs> Kevin, thank you. You know, Kevin and I have worked together many, many times uh, for, on various programs and planning sessions, and we have a standing agreement. Uh, he doesn't tell what he remembers about me during his time at Colorado State, and I don't tell what I remember about him as an undergraduate student at Colorado State. <laughs> Transformation and innovation. Scary words for those of us who remember and used payphones, Xerox machines, 8-track and cassette tapes, Ford 460 motors, steel trailers, and showing horses in eight or nine events a day. But transformation and innovation are what brought us the iPhone, computers, email, diesel trucks, aluminum slant load trailers, world shows, and horses doing things that none of us thought possible just a few years ago. AQHA today is in a time of transformation, just like every successful organization or company that is trying to take better care of its customers, its members, or its clientele. Every successful organization or company today structures itself on a regular basis to better serve its members, its customers, and its constituents. Organizations have to transform in order to maintain their success into the next generation. A few years ago, Harvard Business Review had a great article about the cyclic nature of organizations. It talked about how organizations have peaks and valleys that occur naturally in the organization. The, or, the, or, the article went on to say that if an organization allows itself to fall into a, a trough of decline, that's about a 20-year trip from when it starts down until it gets back up to the peak again. 20 years of decline and 10 years, or 10 years of decline, 10 years to get back to the top. But that article went on to say that well-led organizations jump from one peak to the next. They stay aware of the changing demands and expectations. They change their organizations as they go. They never become cyclic. In fact, they move from one peak to the next and they get better each time they do that, rather than taking that 20-year decline and rise back up again. If AQHA is to meet the challenge of caring for our memberships more effective and efficiently in the future, we have to become more innovative. We have to be attuned to our members' needs and wants. 
Today we are making an effort to ask our members, as we've said several times today, to help us in our transformation. We need you as members to tell us what we're doing that's right for the future of AQHA and tell us what you don't think is working. I feel sure that our pan panel members in a few moments are going to tell us what they chose to change because their constituents and their customers demanded it. They may have done it to survive. They may have done it simply to get better. In our vernacular, they went from a payphone to an iPhone. They went from the steel trailer to an aluminum slant load. They led transformational change. In my opinion, what they have done or are doing is what innovation and transformation is all about. Finding a better way to accomplish the mission of your company, your home operation, or your association in a way that best cares for the needs of your customers, or in our case, our members. To be perfectly blunt, we become innovative because what we're doing in some areas isn't working as well as it once did. An organization like AQHA is becoming innovative and transformational to better care for its members today than at any other time in the history of our organization. But AQHA, Craig, and the staff are asking every day, what can we do to make AQHA membership have a greater value? I think that's the key question if we're going to increase our membership. How do we give our members a greater value than they have right now? What can we do to serve our membership better? What do our members need to make their lives in the horse world better or easier? Most importantly, what can we do to make sure that every experience our members have with AQHA is a positive experience? To transform our association from the mailroom to the executive committee is our goal today. In fact, as we talk about transformation and mention mailroom, that seems a little ironic to me also. Also, just as an aside, before someone asks, how much is this going to cost? We're doing it within our existing budget by reallocating funds and changing priorities. So what are some of the things that AQHA is doing? Ralph and Craig have already mentioned some. Let me bring a few more. First in the office, we're developing a caring attitude. In a, time of, in a time of growth, an organization can do about whatever it wants to as far as customer service is concerned. An organization in growth can take from its members with less regard for service and little regard for care. We are not an organization in growth. Today, AQHA is transforming into an organization that offers care rather than service. We are changing customer service to customer care. That means we need to anticipate what our members need rather than waiting for them to call and then not being ready with what they want or need. We want every experience to be a positive one for our members, and we will work hard at showing empathy for the needs of our members in addition to just caring for them. We're trying to have data that our members need conveniently and easy to access. How many of you have any idea how to use this point system that we've had for 50 years, seems like, on getting your records? I struggle every time I try to find it. It seems like that ought to be a right as a member that we have that data available. We're looking at our budgets as they affect each unit in order to reallocate. We're realizing that in a time of fixed income, and that's what we're in, we have to quit doing those things that aren't wanted or needed in order to do those things members need. We're also reallocating time and resources. We are transforming our operational model. What AQHA is doing is a cultural change. It's been mentioned several times. Those of us who have led change know that change takes time. And it also takes time for those of us who are used to the old way of doing business to realize and appreciate that changes being made will make it for the better. AQHA won't get everything right immediately. I encourage you to give your association a chance to change its culture. Watch for those changes and tell us what you like. Tell us what is working and tell us what still needs to be improved. 
Allow us to give you feedback on why we can't make the changes you want immediately, but what the plans are for those plans in the future. And if you write us a letter, or if you write one to all the directors, <coughs> instead of the EC, give us an address so that we can contact you and communicate back with you. We want to give you, we want to try to answer your questions about our association. Today, AQHA is in the process of changing to an organization that offers care each of us needs in a timely and efficient manner. We're working at becoming your association in more than just name. I have a friend who leads a lot of strategic planning for organizations. One of the questions that he asks when he finds out that an organization wants to make change, he looks at the leaders and says, do you mean it or are you just kidding? Because I think a lot of times when we do strategic planning, we do it just to write it down. Do we mean it or are we just kidding? I believe Craig and the staff mean it when they say they want to show our membership that we care about them. I know that this executive committee means it and several of the executive committees before this one meant it too. Our goals are to have members to talk positively about their interaction with AQHA, to talk positively about how each registration and transfer, how easy they were, how fast the turnaround for a call was or how easy it was to get data on their horses. Won't it be fun when we can enter a show on our smartphones before we leave home. And when we leave the show, we can pull up score sheets or times on our phones or computers on the way home or to the hotel. Won't it be great for our members to tell their friends about the positive experience they had with AQHA? There are so many exciting things that are possible with innovative thinking. I can tell you that as a member of the executive committee, I am excited to see up close the changes that are taking place. We are an organization in transformation. We are using innovation to change how we care for our members. Yes, it will be change. Yes, it will be different. But like the aluminum slant load trailer, it'll be better. <clears throat> Most of those of us who have resisted change in our lives now admit that the cell phone wasn't so bad. The diesel truck is probably a good idea. The aluminum trailer is better than the old steel trailer. And in fact, if we had known how much better these things were going to be, we would have accepted them earlier. And in fact, would have probably asked for some of these changes. That's what I believe is going to happen at AQHA. In a couple of years, our membership, you, will see how much we care about you. You will see that we are trying to make every contact you have with us a positive experience. You'll not only see change, you will wish it had occurred earlier. AQHA is in transformation. I think you can feel it here at the convention. We're transforming to take better care of you, our members, of our horses, and our association. We're trying to make every experience a positive one. I'm excited about the future of our organization, and I hope that each of you will be also as you listen to the rest of our speakers. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your interest and love of this association. I look forward to working with you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hurd. He has always been excellent at both casting a vision and being a true change agent. And there are buildings and programs across the United States and lots of different universities that uh, uh, speak to his effectiveness in that. Um, I, I want to take just a minute and uh, get an opportunity to uh, get your feedback now. If we can move to our polling slide here. Um, hold on just a second before you. That question. There we go. All right, the question is this. Uh, which statement best describes your perception in terms of the service you receive as a member of AQHA? Both Craig and uh, Dr. Hurd talked about that a lot. I get excellent service from AQHA and see no significant opportunity for improvement. B, I get good service from AQHA, but would like to see uh, some things become faster and more uh, automated. Or C, AQHA lags other businesses and organizations I interact with in terms of the way it interacts and communicates with its members and delivers its service and support. Um, I think you can still vote even though that's clicking, but uh, go ahead and vote through that. A, B, or C?
to that. We've gained some people in here, gained some voters, or people picked up additional devices. 150 some. All in, all done? All right, let's see what you say. All right, so, so B, get good service from AQHA, but like to see things become faster and more automated. And there's a group of you that say, you know, really when I compare the service I get from AQHA to other consumer kind of entities and organizations, uh, it may lag a little bit. And, and I think we've heard a commitment to uh, maybe not being exactly like Amazon, but making some progress. Next question. Um, open this up for polling for some reason. There we go. <laughs> All right. Next question. Which statement best describes your perception of the organizational changes Craig discussed? AQH is behind the curve and must move quickly to implement and execute exec uh, organizational transformation. B. AQHA needs to make some additional modifications and adjustments to the organization and how it operates, but change must be slow and incremental to avoid alienating members. Or C, AQHA is fine as it is, and I see the cha uh, changes outlined as a waste of time and resources. A, B, or C? All in, all done, and I've closed it up here. All right. Behind the curve, and so I think there's a lot of support in the audience today saying we've got to move quickly to implement changes, and it sounds like uh, the executive team has lots of support for the actions and activities you all are, are pursuing. A couple of comments before we uh, move forward just in terms of uh, the, the panel. And, uh, you know, when we think of transformation, I, I, I think in terms of the butterfly and, and, and truly things that look and feel not just minor changes, but transformation. And in fact, when you talk about uh, transformation as a definition, uh, transformation is seen as a shift in the business culture. You've heard both Craig and Dr. Hurd and Ralph all talk about the organizational culture. And culture is something that not only happens in the office, it happens in the membership. The shift in the business culture of an organization resulting from a change in the underlying strategy and processes. It's both where we're going and the processes and systems we put around that strategy to get us to that end point that the organization has used in the past. A transformational change is designed to be organization-wide and enacted over time. It won't happen immediately. It will happen over time. And as we talk about trans transformative change, I, I do have to pick on Dr. Hurd just a little bit now that he sat down for now. Is uh, he comes from Tennessee, and there was a story of the Tennessee boy that, uh, pretty good ball player, and uh, he was invited up to uh, University of Kentucky, uh, this has been a number of years ago, to, uh, to try out for the basketball team, and, and he and his dad came from the hills and hollers of Tennessee up to uh, the big camp town of Lexington, Kentucky. Um, the, the coach told him to, to, to meet him downtown, he'd get him checked into a hotel, and uh, the next day go and, and take a tour of the campus. And of course, the, the, the two checked into the hotel, and as they walked in, they saw a couple of doors just like this, and about that quickly, an elderly lady with a cane wobbled up to the, the elevator and eased her way into the, uh, the elevator. The doors closed. They turned around and began checking in, and moments later, the bell dinged, the doors opened, they turned around, and out walked the most beautiful, gorgeous college girl you'd ever seen in your life. And the old boy looked at the dad, and the dad looked at the old boy and says, son, he says, next time we come to Big Town, we're going to have to take your mom and run her through one of them machines. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? It's an old joke, and it's not mine, but it makes the point I'm trying to make. Transformative change. Transformative change is more than incremental. There will be some things that feel pretty revolutionary, okay, and not just evolutionary. And so let's talk about a couple of organizations that I think have, have, have gone through some absolutely transformational changes. One of them is General Electric. And of course, uh, one of the more storied CEOs in all of history is GE's Jack Welch. And uh, following Jack Welch was a difficult uh, task. Uh, this gentleman uh, came in, and uh, Jeff Immelt uh, has followed him, just recently retired. And if you look at GE's stock performance, one could make an argument uh, of whether he did good or bad at GE. But no doubt about it, four days after he entered GE, 2000, or, uh, September 11th, 2001 hit, and his world changed immediately. He went through a massive banking crisis. GE Capital was a humongous part of their business. 
and uh, we saw the, the banking crisis. He bought and sold $100 billion worth of businesses over his 15 or 16 year tenure at, at GE. And what I like about this quote, what I want to challenge you with it as we, as we move towards a panel is he said this, he said, we were a classic conglomerate. Now people are calling us a 125 year old startup. We're a digital industry company that has defined the future of inter the internet of things. Look at that, change is in our DNA. We have endured because we have the determination to shape our own future. 125 year old startup. You have some great history, some great legacy, some, 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 some great traditions, but change has to be in our DA, DNA, and we have to be willing to shape our own future. What did he do? He did a lot of things. We won't spend a lot of time talking about those things, but he changed the portfolio, uh, got him out of the uh, appliance business. He, he sold the, uh, uh, or a lot of the financial assets, if you will. Uh, he refocused them on making jet engines. Uh, he made them truly a global company, 180 countries in the world have offices. And, uh, and what are the lessons that he learned? I want to go through these real quickly um, because I think they, they, they have some, some merit as we enter our discussion this afternoon and talk to a couple of industry executives from the, uh, the cable and communication industries that, that may be able to uh, speak to, to many of these. Number one, he says you have to be disciplined and focused. You, you, you've got to not just look at the next bright, shiny thing out there. You've got to establish a plan and be disciplined in, in your follow through around that. You have to rewire your brain. His comment is that, you know, when it comes to change, you need to think differently. You've got to be willing to help people see the need for change. It goes back to that burning platform we talked about. They, they, they've got to be so intent, so committed to the cause that they recognize that the, the business may not exist without it. You've got to be all in. You've got to make a sustained commitment. It can't be an experiment, he says. You've got to be resilient. There's going to be some bumps in the road. There's going to be some things that, that get challenging and, and certainly some projects that don't work. He says you have to listen and act all at the same time because just because you have a plan in place doesn't mean you've got the entire plan from beginning to end. You've got to be willing to learn and think and grow and change as you move on. And finally, he says you've got to embrace new kinds of talent and look at that word, a new culture and new ways of doing things. So I think those are some pretty valuable lessons as we think about what can change. And we've got some people, if you'll start making your way to the stage, we've got some people here today that I think can speak to this and uh, have the ability to, to, uh, to really understand the horse industry at the same time. Our first panelist is uh, someone that many of you know. She began her career in the mobile wireless industry where she served in a variety of management positions with the former GTE wireless control, uh, GTE wireless and control cellular. She's enjoyed a highly honored cable and telecommunications career, served as chief, op chief operating officer, is that right, for charter communications and executive vice president of cable TV operating divisions of Cox Communications. She's now come full circle and she works in the consulting world uh, for a, a number of wireless projects and clients. Recently, she's also been involved in leading AQHA's marketing efforts to serve, support, and engage diverse membership of the uh, global AQHA industry. Would you please welcome Maggie Belleville. And a partner in crime, I understand. Is that right, Dan? The second panelist comes to us with 20 years of experience in customer care and financial operations with Cox Communication. He joined Cox in 1998 as a business manager, or I'm sorry, a manager of business operations in San Diego, and has served in a variety of roles since then, including regional vice president of operations. In 2014, he also assumed responsibility for business operations, and in 2015, gain customer care, a comment that we've heard shared several times today, and I think he's going to help us define the difference between customer service and customer care. He's an active member of the American Quarter Horse Association Foundation Board and has been engaged in riding horses all of his life. Again, please welcome Dan Henson. And our final panelist in this trio is also someone who is deeply engaged with AQHA. She has a 30-year career in telecommunications. She's held senior level positions in the wireless, broadband, and cable industries. And she has been deeply involved in a number of large-scale change initiatives related to people, process, customer operations, customer experience, and design, and has some great insight to share with us even from this morning. She started her own company, Sadler Allen, a consultancy that specializes in helping companies 
implement the kind of transformational change that we're talking about today, would you please welcome Kimberly Edmonds. As we get started today, I, I want to make mention, you should have access to some cards, or there may be some AQHA folks coming around with cards. Uh, I'm going to begin the questioning process by asking these, uh, these panelists some questions, but we want you to weigh in as well, and we want this to be interactive. I think it's, uh, it, it, it's quite unique that we have an opportunity to have three individuals uh, who have such uh, uh, experience in transformational change at such high levels uh, outside the agricultural and equine industry and yet can still speak our language and really understand how our organization works. So we're, we're anxious to get their, their feedback. Feel free to write your questions down and then uh, hold them up in the air and uh, Ralph and the juniors and a number of folks are going to be walking around. If you have a question, you just hold it up. They'll pick it up and we will uh, get to those in just a little while. I guess I'd begin, um, and, and Maggie, maybe begin with you and, and the rest of you can chime in, but, but we talked a lot about transformation. Just tell us at a high level, what's driving the need for transformation in business and organizations of all kinds, not just AQHA? Well, the need for transformation is simply because the world is moving so quickly. It is chaos. And as soon as um, one idea comes up, um, another one surpasses it. Um, I remember when I um, was in the cable industry, you know, cable, it was, you know, cable TV. But we knew we had to make more use of our network, drive more revenue. So we um, implemented and developed high-speed data, which is now your, what you use every day. We developed digital TV, we developed te telephony, and we went cloud-based te telephony because we had to survive and we had to keep our customers. It was a, a, about getting and keeping the customer. So um, what's driving change is the customer, the need for customers, and there's somebody else out there. Competition is always looking to take your customers away. Yeah, yeah the competitive environment has a huge implication on businesses in general, but it's not just the competitive environment, it's also meeting the needs of the future, and I think sometimes we blend the two. So when you think of the changing environment and what we need to do from an organizational standpoint, it's not just where we are today, it's playing to where the puck's going to be, and I think sometimes we think short-sighted, so it's not just about losing members today, but how do we mitigate that curve and then elevate ourselves so that we not only retain customers and get back to where we were, but to actually surpass that for a, for a future state. And so I'll use an example for us. You know, we started out as a cable television company, actually newspapers, if I go back 125 years ago, involved, evolved into um, the cable industry, and now we're evolving into healthcare. You wouldn't combine all of those, but there are common threads through each. And so we're thinking about what the next 25 years look for us. We need to do the same within AQHA. And, and let's talk about AQHA for a minute. Um, and sure. Kim, let's start, start with you because you did have some conversations even this morning and you've done a lot of research, but from the outside looking in, and I would ask each one of you three to answer this question, uh, what do you see as the key areas that need to be transformed, if you will, within AQHA? What would be some that you would identify? Uh, yes, we, you know, we deal a lot with people, whether they're customer people or employee people. And one of the things that's very unique about our world today is that we have four generations in our environment. And they, you know, we have uh, folks in the environment that don't know world, the world without the internet. And then we have people in the environment that internet was not a part of their entire life. And so trying to serve a, up a customized experience for all of those generations is, is one of the big challenges. As I've been learning more about AQHA, I see that is, as one of the biggest challenges, is how do we uh, embrace the millennials and the way that they want to enter the in equine industry, and at the same time honor the legacy folks that are still in the industry as well, and provide you know, sort of uh, the customer experience of choice for that entire membership. That's a great point. Dan? I think one of the things that Kimberly touched on are the generational gaps. And it really is an opportunity for us 
to bridge some of those gaps. I'm 50 plus years old, I wanna call, I wanna have a conversation. I had my nieces and nephews all weekend this weekend. All they wanted to do was be on a, a, a device. They're connected, but they connect in a different way and they get faster results than what I ever thought about getting. And so how do we leverage those two and meet in the middle? Because it isn't one or the other, it's actually both. And what we need to be able to do is engage those folks so that we attract more talent because our burning platform is really around membership. And when you think about a membership um, campaign, it's about every one of us here today. It isn't about the three of us sitting up here talking about transformation and how we have to change, but it's also how do we engage others in that process, get them involved and get that commitment so that we all together grow this absolutely wonderful organization. It is, it is interesting, you know, people are, and generations are just totally rewired. My son's 14, yeah. uh, obviously I'm a little older than that, and, uh, and, and I just having some conversation, we're talking about some watering systems, and I had a conversation as I told him that I was gonna call these folks in Wyoming that I knew, that recently put a new solar um, uh, pump in for the windmill. And uh, he's so dad, he said, I'm part of a chat group. He says, let me reach out to them. And he did. He came back to me that night yet, right? Before I'd ever even thought about making the phone call, was saying, look at what this guy, I had no idea who this guy was, but he wrote this lengthy expose, if you will, about what he's done. And it's just how different he and I think about, okay, I have a problem, how am I gonna solve it? And, 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 and his immediately go-to, right, was electronic. My immediate go-to was, let me call a guy that I know in Wyoming that can help me. Yeah. And so, to your point, we've got to find a way to bridge that gap. Thank you. And I agree with the demographic challenges and the challenges of the generation. And I guess because of my background, I go to a, a little bit of a different place. And that's the organization and its effectiveness. What I found in business and doing these transformations is you have to set clear accountabilities. And those accountabilities have got to be met or there's consequences. Um, also, we would infuse the organization with new innovative thinking. Um, people not from us, not from Atlanta, people who knew where we needed to go and had the expertise and experience to get us there. That infusion at all parts of the organization had all boats rise. People said, oh crap, I better get on board. And it worked. Um, the other thing is you had to be very, very clear that there is no silent disagreement. And if you do disagree, we gotta talk about it because you've got to be on board to do your job and make this transformation. And, and finally, you have to support calculated risk taking. Because this is a big risk for everybody. But if you've got your ducks in a row and you think 80% I can make it, let's support that. Because if you mess up, you have to fess up and then dress up. <laughs> so you, you really, I really look at the organization, the talent, the commitment, and the sense of urgency. I think everyone has said that previously. You gotta feel this passion. You gotta care about those um, employees. I remember once I was in a call center and I was listening to a call and a guy called and said, I wanna disconnect my phone or my cable. And, and the girl says, I can do that for you. I can do it right away. Okay, it's done. And he says, well, what about this Showtime and HBO? What are they? Well, she had a little paragraph right up in her cube, and she read those off to him and just stayed quiet. He said, well, okay, thanks again. Hung up. And I said to her, um, why didn't you try to sell them Showtime and HBO? Oh, I'm not here to sell. I'm here to serve. And that was just so, such an epiphany for me. And that's the other thing. We have to start growing our revenues. And I think in, in just educating people on what they can do, I think will take us a long way towards our goals. Well, and part of that education, I think we under, need to understand what transformation is because it is not a one and done, it's ongoing. And there are certain steps that have to take place and it starts at the top, and you have executive decisions, you have executive actions. They all need to be in alignment. And you also have to build a coalition of support. When you think of organizations, and when you think of transforming an organization, I'll give you an example. So NSBA has been here this week. They are a fantastic partner 
when we think about enabling technology today, does NSBA need to enable the same technology that we need to enable? Maybe not. Now, we don't know what the answer is, but what we do know is that we have a declining industry. We have great partners that are out there. How do we leverage them? How do we leverage the technologies to really get our industry to the forefront of where it should be? I, I, would, I would say that would be a, a BHAG. And if you don't know what a BHAG is, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And how do we set that goal of being the equine leader globally? Globally, where we lead all those organizations, that would be a BHAG for me. Yeah, and Kim, I want to turn attention to you because uh, let, let's just talk practically. You've heard some of the initiatives that are underway. You've heard some of the vision that has been cast uh, by our leaders of our organization of what we could be and should be and what this could look like two or three years from now. Um, this is your business, consulting with organizations, helping them walk through this very difficult process. What are the challenges that AQHA needs to be prepared to deal with here in terms of the transformation? Yeah, a couple of things. You know, uh, one of the biggest, and I think Maggie sort of hit on it, is just the cultural resilience to be able to get on board with the change. Um, often we've done things the way we've done them for forever and it makes it difficult to be innovative. Um, in the session we had this morning, we were talking about um, you know, what, what is it that members uh, have as a goal. And so our, our model's simple. First of all, what is it that the customer's trying to accomplish and how do we focus on their success with the minimum amount of effort and with the greatest amount of joy. And so um, one of the things that's really important is that we see things from the outside in. And so we talked about what's really the goal of a registration. You know, internally we might see that as a transaction that goes from A to B, but the real goal is so that I have that great moment of truth when I'm showing my horse. And so if we, if we start from that goal and then we work our way back to what that process needs to be, we really create a transformation. And if we internally aren't willing to do that because of all of our policies or our rules or the things that we think we have to do, then it stands in the way of transformation. And so it's really uh, keeping the entire organization focused on what makes our members, our customers successful. And then let's design a, a, a process internally that helps that member to be successful. And if, if folks are on board with that, then typically transformation can happen. The other big sort of roadblock is the, the level of financial investment. And so as we, we design new experiences, we have to design with the ideas, is this viable in terms of the financial implications of it? Because if it's desirable um, from a customer perspective, but it's not viable because we can't afford it, then we can't design to that. So I think sometimes the financial and then the people parts of things can kind of stand in the way of that transformation happening, and so we have to care for both of those things. Okay. Dan, um, your experience at Cox, I mean, are there some challenges that you navigated that you could see having to navigate at AQHA, and what guidance would you give us? Yeah, great question, Kevin. Um, so when we went through transformation last time, it was with about 20,000 employees. And we had 21 separate entities with 21 separate P&Ls. And so it's a large endeavor. You're talking about, about a $15 billion in revenue business. And so the first thing that you don't want to do is wreck the business that you have. The second thing that you really want to ensure that you do is engage the right people in the process. And so we had a very tiered approach because we needed the executives to be involved, but we also needed what we called firewalkers involved. People within the organization, customers external to the organization that could really help us navigate through this change. That all sounds easy, but it's really, really tough when the rubber meets the road. The kind of the stroke of the pen, the executive decisions, it's easy to say we're gonna go through transformation. It is really difficult to execute on it. And I think that we, what you have to be prepared for is a mitigation plan. So if you think about people, and in our case it was 20,000 employees, 22,000 I think at the time, how do we engage them? How do we keep them with us? And then how do we leverage them to get through this process? And I think in many cases, what people forget are the people. 
technology is a cornerstone. It can absol absolutely enable us to do our jobs better, but at the end of the day, it's done through our people. And I think that's probably one of the biggest lessons we learned because we did have some failure points. Our failure points were around leaders that couldn't deliver a message and stay on point. They, there would be that unintended consequence. I'd say, yes, I support it and go, shit, this is never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> this too shall pass. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, uh, and so I think that's really understanding where people are, meeting them where they are, and then helping them navigate through that situation. Maggie, you have some comments. I, I want to add to your thinking this, because what you guys are striking at is the cultural issue. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you that, that I've seen it in spades over my 26 years in consulting, and, and I'm seeing it happen, or will see it happen shortly. We, we talk about the, the culture. I, I spent two days with Bear Crop uh, in Kansas City earlier this week. Of course, many of you know the pending merger with Monsanto. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, Monsanto's culture and the German Bear culture yeah. are two very different cultures. And, and it is very, it's going to be very interesting. I'm not suggesting it won't work. I'm just saying that they know, and everybody knows, that, that one of the challenges is not so much the business part of it, but how do you get people to come together, work together, share a common vision, and move forward? So, Maggie, as you as you so, on that, go ahead. Maggie, before you go, go ahead, just Dan. one second. I, I, heard, I do I have one other. I heard silent disagreement, Danny, I, when you ahead, said, Dan. oh, that, shit, I don't know what I can do. So yeah. that's an example of silent disagreement. That is silent disagreement. Okay, go ahead, Dan. So the one point that I would like to make is as you are going through change, if you can find common things such as values, if you think about the values of the people in this room, there are a lot of things that we have in common. When you can start to rally around values and core things that are important to us, whether it's the well-being of our horses, our families, the people around us that we show with all the time, those are things that you can find in common because it's not just what is changing, also what's not changing. I'm a little meaner than Danny. <laughs> and, and, you know. Oh, it, <laughs> you have, now that's not silent disagreement, that is agreement. Go ahead. No, but at some point, you have to deal with the naysayers, the non invented here sayers, we've always done it this way sayers. You can't let them continue with that because it bleeds into what you're trying to do. Um, I remember at Cox when we were um, rolling out telephony, we had one general manager who refused to let us do it the way we were doing it. And um, he wanted to do it from where he was, not centrally. And literally, we had to cut him off at the knees. I mean, we had to do that because he was seeping that poison into the rest of the organization. So you can't let that happen. And you have to deal with those people, either get on board or get out. E easier to, to say with an employee than a member. And so my question to you, uh, because I've seen this in other member-driven organizations, mm -hmm. these people are out at a mm -hmm. show, somebody starts talking smack about what's yep. going on in Amarillo. Uh, what do they say? How do they handle that? I, I, well, look, I think you all got to go back and just say, Give them a chance. Give them a try. We're finally getting there. Uh, it's taken Craig time to figure all this out, to see what he's got, and see where we got to go. I 4.0 has been a scapegoat long enough. We've blamed it for the lights going out or you know everything else. That's got to stop, and Craig's on it. But we've got to give him the support and the backing that he needs. We can't go back home and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not going to work. Because if we do that and we don't support it, then he's not going to be successful and we're not going to have a fabulous breed organization. We're not going to be the equine leader globally. And that's what we got to become. That's great. Yeah. So some very specific audience questions, then I may return to a couple of mine. But uh, Kimberly, your impression of AQHA phone services, pros and cons, and where do we need to go? <laughs> so. Um, it, it, on, on a couple or uh, three levels. From a technology perspective, clearly way behind the, the curve. I mean, some of the basic uh, customer service call center technologies, um, we're gonna, that's, a, that's just money, right? We can fix that. 
um, get folks into the 21st century. And I think that the organization's working off Stone Age tools when it comes to uh, uh, customer service technologies and the ways that we can serve customers and give them a great customized experience. We're not leveraging that yet, but we, we will. Um, from a process perspective, and I think Maggie sort of hit on it, um, and we talked about it a lot this morning about, you know, one of the common themes was it takes too darn long to get one thing done. There's lots of paper, there's lots of snail mail. You know, in the digital age, there are just different ways to get things done and feel good that we still maintain the integrity of the breed um, without all the paper. I think the members are sort of tired of just the, the bureau bureaucratic process to get things done. So time is of essence. Uh, people are, you know, we're, we're used to getting things very quickly. If I order something today, I get it tomorrow. And that's really what we're competing against is the other experiences that people have. Um, so time, uh, I mean, I'm technology, process, and then people. Um, and I think, again, to what these guys are saying is that at some point, if people don't want to move with you, then you have to move on and, and they have to deselect from the organization. And I think the people part of it, um, what I'm so impressed with is the absolute commitment, um, the attitude, the passion for horses. Um, you're in this incredible space where um, you have this very, um, in a lot of cases, science uh, industry, but at the same time, the art and the joy of owning a horse, showing a horse, and that kind of thing, I think is absolutely um, a, a great platform to build from in terms of the commitment that people have um, about, about the industry and about the horses, and I think that's gonna be a great foundation to build on. Maggie, you have something to add. Yeah, I was, I was telling Kimberly about transferring a horse in my name. So I bought a horse a couple weeks ago, and I got out the transfer, and I filled everything out, and I checked all the boxes on the bottom, speed, FedEx, get it quick, because I was anxious about this. I was worried if I just let it go normally, I wouldn't get those papers back for over a month. How many of you been through? We've been conditioned to check all the speed and it's urgent, rush, rush, and oh, here's FedEx to bring it back to me because we don't know how long it's gonna be to get the papers. Just imagine how fabulous it would be if we could do it and it'd be turned around overnight without having to pay special fees. I bet that's a great revenue line item in the AQHA p &L, but we can find other ways to make up that money. Well, and, and it's interesting that you talked about that because people said, you know, I pay extra to get normal. I pay extra so that I can get a normal time frame, and that's, that's not creating uh, value. And, and to your point around you know, the anxiety that you feel when you turn in that paperwork, which was a lot of what we heard this morning and as people talked about the emotion around it, um, we first have to become uh, reliable. And, and one of the first rules of Six Sigma is stability before performance. So we have to be reliable on the core things that people are trying to do within the membership, and then we can move to really performing and, and being differentiating and creating that custom experience. But the reliability piece that when you send that in and we say three days, it's three days every time. Kim, Kimberly built a um, call center um, years ago in San Diego. We were rolling out all these new products. And we knew our current call centers couldn't handle the calls, they couldn't handle the sales, they were service oriented. And she devised, um, because there were, were so many products, she devised a, an approach for the, cust for the customer service reps called um, Expert by, by skill. Yeah. Universal by Product and Expert. Uh, we, we, we called it universal by product and experts by skill, meaning that you need to support the bundle and understand, you know, we're voice, video, and data, but you might not be a great salesperson, so we want to make sure that the salespeople are selling and the support people are supporting and the tech support folks are doing the technical stuff, but across the entire product set. So we had a people strategy that enabled and empowered the business. Dan, I was going to ask you another question, and that is around the customer experience. You know, we talked about, um, we used to talk about customer service, now we talk about customer care.
care and customer experience and this journey that we're talking about. So, so, so explain to us the difference and talk to us about how uh, AQHA will benefit as we think about the overall customer experience and not just customer service. Yeah, when I think about customer service, it's completing a task. When I think about an experience, it's evoking an emotion and it's a bigger, deeper connection. And so how do you transition from just checking a box to creating a relationship, engaging that people person, knowing what they're calling for, what they need, and having that relationship. And I think it's a big difference. And so one of the ways in which we're doing that in today's environment are called journeys, customer journeys. So if I know that um, Liz Long is a pleasure rider and she is you know, calling in and needs to know about shows, when she calls in, I need to pick up the phone, hey Liz, I'm sure you're calling about the show, we have this great information. That is the service part about it. It's a wonderful experience, we know who she is, but you can even go a step further. Liz, did you know that we had X, Y, and Z? And this is right in your wheelhouse. It actually opens up an opportunity for a sale and a broader connection. Oh, I see that your membership is expiring. You start to go a step further. You don't just stop with Liz and she rides pleasure horses. You go further and say, she rides pleasure horses. She loves being engaged in you know, the long-term association. We have events coming up. And you start playing to where the puck's going to be, not to where it was. And then she gets off the phone or off the chat, and she's had a much greater, deeper emotional connection. And we know who she is and what she wants. And it will enable us as an organization to grow further because you have that connection. That then creates an opportunity for a sale. Kimberly talked about it earlier. We referred to it as serving, solving, and selling. You first have to solve. The, or sell, <laughs> you, sorry, you first have to serve, then you solve, and then you sell. That's great. And so having that capability and creating that, you have to have a connection with the customer and it can't just be a checking the box. Yeah, it, it, it can't be the, the typical uh, rote, you know, press one if you want this, press two if you want that. Kimberly, question for you from the audience. How critical is customer service to transformation? So is that, is that an incidental part of the whole transformation process or is it core and central to the transformation process? I think in, in, in the case of where a QHA today is really critical uh, to the, the, the transformation in that a lot, it, it, it serves as one of the largest touch points with the customer. And just to add to what Dan said, it's the whole experience. Um, just in listening to the calls over the last several days and listening to hundreds of calls as, as you guys are calling in, um, it's the whole experience. It might be that you landed in the call center simply because you couldn't complete your transaction on the web. Well, that web experience is an experience along your journey. And so when, when a representative, maybe you're calling and there's already that frustration there, they're having to acknowledge and be empathetic to the fact that you tried to do this on your own in a, through the website. You had a not uh, an unsuccessful experience, and now you're landing in the call center. And how do we acknowledge that journey that you've had to create a sense of a sense of urgency? And so I think, particularly as it w relates to the broader customer experience, the the customer service team that you know you call into is critical because if something has failed along the way, they have the opportunity to recover. And if they can recover that situation, often customers are even more loyal than if they never had a situation. I like to use the example of a warranty on a TV. If my TV never breaks, I don't know if the warranty works or not. But if it breaks and the warranty works, now I have the basis for loyalty to that brand or to that TV type or to the store that I bought that from. And so that, that is a really critical, the customer service group is a really critical part of this transformation. I do need to ask you a question in full disclosure. United Airlines is not one of your clients, is it? No, it's not. Okay, I wanted to make sure. I, <laughs> you, you all probably saw the advertisement last year after that incident that Southwest came up and said, we beat our competitors, not our customers. Did you see that? <laughs> I love that one. Um, question for you, and, and this one maybe to Maggie and Dan with your horse experience. Um, great question for, for an organization, and, and you know, one of the great values of all agricultural organizations, particularly the horse industry, 
is the tradition and the history that we have in this organization. And I saw my friend Peggy Brown, I think she's left now, but you talk about some people even in this audience that uh, have been there from the beginning, families and so forth. Um, how do you balance the rate and speed of needed change with continuing to uphold the illustrious past of an organization? How do you balance those two, Maggie? Well, I think that you have to give people the place where they're most comfortable to deal with the organization. Um, I, I, I go back to Sears. Remember you called Sears for carpet. Well, we can send a salesman out, you can do it online, or, or we can do it over the phone. So choices, choices in how to uh, relate to our uh, membership. You know, we've got fast millennials who just you know, they want to text and, and go online and be done with it. We have um, our heritage ranchers and, and breeders who want a relationship with somebody on the phone. Um, and then there's touch points in between. So I think you have to honor the traditions, the past, um, and you have to be ready for the future. So it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's definitely doable. Yeah, I yeah. think from my perspective, first and foremost, you honor the legacy. Um, this is a, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful organization, and we have a lot of strength to build upon. And so for me, it's first honoring the legacy and then moving toward creating our own legacy because it's our jobs, it's my job as a mid-50s individual within this organization to then lay the foundation for a fantastic organization for those that are growing up today. So, yeah, good job. Um, this is a great question. What, what, what if I'm not cons computer savvy? How can I do self-service? Th th this gets to be challenging because, you know, all of a sudden people are like, now wait a second, I used to pay for this and now I'm going to go online. You know, I mean, honestly, in the registry system, I used to fill out records and, and send them to the, the office and they inputted them. Now, I'm sitting down in front of my computer doing all that myself and it's like, so, so now I'm the employee and the member and, and, and maybe I'm not very computer savvy. How do you address that you? issue? Good. How are you doing? Well, you know, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with someone and we were talking about some of the holdup uh, in registration has to do with the, the release of the breeding report. And um, the person I was talking to you saying, well, I, I don't want to go up on a computer. I don't want to deal with any technology. And I asked her the question. I said, if the computer called you and said, you know, this foal's just born, these are the information you need to know, are you willing to release the, the, the breeding report, yes or no? press one for yes, two for no, and she goes, yeah, I'll do that. And so I think that, you know, we, we have to be careful as technologists that we don't force technology onto people, but that we enable uh, what we're trying to do with technology in a people-friendly way. And I think that the technology today, with natural language, with AI, has the ability to do that, to give a personalized experience and to allow people to interact with that technology the way that they want to. I mean, there was a time when we didn't want to get our money from an ATM, but just about everybody does that today. But it wasn't forced on us. We still had the bank teller. We still had a way to interact. And I think that's what we have to do is we transform on the technology side is to make sure that we don't force it uh, to people that don't want it, but that we enable it for the folks that do want so it, to it use really it. Becomes optional it becomes optional and, yeah. and it's doable. I, I really think it has to be simple and intuitive. And when you think of those two things, for example, if I'm an AQHA member and they know I breed one or two horses a year and I'm going to register a foal, I put in my ID, everything self populates and says, Is this what you're looking for? Hit yes, boom, you're done. There are technologies out there today that are smart enough to do this, and I think in cases like that, people are willing to put that effort in. I, if I look at my mother, and my mother thinks that she's got to go through 10 reports and 10 pages, she throws her hands up and says, forget it, and I don't blame her, I would too. But in today's environment, we now have opportunities to make it really simple and really intuitive, which adds a ton of value, which, by the way, increases loyalty, increases revenue, and increases your membership. Maggie had a comment, looks like. So I'm sitting in a ladies' league luncheon, because that's what I do now. And, 
And um, I'm sitting at a table with some uh, ladies, and you know, they're very in age, from very young me to really old, nice ladies. And they start doing a trivia game. And so they're asking questions. And I'm sitting there, and we're trying to think of the answer as a team. And this little lady, 80-year-old lady, is sitting next to me, pulls out her smartphone, and Googles the answer. And I'm like, ooh, I don't think we're supposed to be doing that. But I guess my point is, I'm not supposed to cheat, 80-year-old cheating on her iPhone. How about? But I think what it speaks to is how adaptive we've become with so many of our um, hardware, our accessories, that even 80-year-old ladies learn to cheat on her iPhone by Googling the answer. So we say we're scared and we say, oh, I think it's more about the volume, the 10 pages. Um, if we could just point and click, I think anybody can do it and we wouldn't be so scared. So that's something about technology. Let's talk about people for a minute because people are so critical to any transformation effort. And, and this is, a, um, I, I think, a, a very straightforward question, but one that would be curious to, to get your perspective of. Uh, this person writes, some AQHA employees are knowledgeable and helpful, but many others are neither. How does AQHA identify and encourage the former and transform the latter? Okay, and, and, and so it's a, the thought of one member, and, and clearly, um, I, I suspect there are differences in experience and education and, and the ability to be helpful and so forth, but this person is saying some, some are very knowledgeable and helpful and others are, are not one or the other or neither. Um, so so uh, how, how do we change that? Well, I think, I think, personally, I think there are some people that are retired in place. It's a great place to work in Amarillo. It's fun. They have food. I mean, they, they ha it's a nice place. They're all great friends. But at some point, you got, you got to step up or step out. And I think that's about setting meaningful goals, a timeline, accountabilities, and there's consequences. If you succeed, great. And if you don't, Donald Trump's made a lot new jobs for people out there. So there is another job to be had somewhere. Okay. So, so tell us this, um, Dan, back to you and, and, and Kimberly for just a minute. Um, you, you have, can, can look into the AQHA with different goggles and you know what other organizations have done to, to really improve the customer experience. And I would just be curious, put your finger on a couple of things that you think AQHA can do to really improve that customer experience. Dan, you first. I guess one of the things that I think about, and it surprised me as we went through transformation the last time, and oh, by the way, my organization is transforming again today, six years later, which I think is an important note. Um, it's understanding what the value that it's going to bring, because when we start, first started to transform, I think it was really hard to see the value that was gonna come out of it. And what we realized is that when we created these fantastic journeys for our customers that it actually elongated their tenure with us. So not only did they stay with us longer and pay us more, but our organization started to grow again. And you know that, that was one of our goals and it was stated up front. However, that was one of the surprises through, through the process that it actually worked. And I think that's something that AQHA can look forward to because once you go through that transformation, there is a light at the end of the tunnel if you do it with purpose and with your people. Go ahead, Kimber. And, and I just add that, you know, even I've been working a lot with the people in customer service, and I think. You know, coming into it from telecommunications, from technology companies, I thought, well, you know, it's just horses. How difficult could it be? Well, uh, I think it's it's a complex uh, business that that we've made more complicated by our own doing. And so one of the, I think, things that uh, we will be challenged with and that we need to work and solve is um, keeping the representatives trained um, on on the questions that they're being asked and the things they're being asked to do. DNA can get fairly complicated in this horse world. And, um, and so uh, to Dan's point earlier about things being intuitive, if you think about like uh, Microsoft Excel, you buy Microsoft Excel, you 
load it on your computer and you go about your business. It's intuitive. You can almost teach yourself. Um, right now, the environment is not intuitive. And so there's lots of documents and training and, and so forth. And so we have to give the representatives the kind of help they need so that, that you get a consistent answer when you call. Um, attitude is a different issue around being helpful, but actually having that knowledge, we need to put that at their fingertips. So they're not having to remember everything, but that we provide them with a help system that's in a Google search, uh, that, that articles come up and they give a consistent answer every time. So I think the training and the help tools um, and the, just the desktop tools that they have when a member is calling in, it's going to be really critical that we solve for that and that we give them state-of-the-art um, uh, help systems so that they can get through that question very consistently every time someone calls. The attitude part is, is about accountability to what Maggie said, that we're not going to tolerate you know, low quality um, or a bad attitude on the phones. I want to combine, and these are tough to combine, but, but we're running short of time, and I want, to, I want to tee up a couple of questions that came from the audience and see if, if uh, uh, particularly uh, Maggie or Dan would want to take a crack at either one or both of these. One is, despite all the needs for transformation, how does the association remain uh, its own identity, integrity, and continuity of preserving the stock horse heritage? So, so it's about, you know, remember our roots, and no, we are not a video game, and we are not, you know, we are not Amazon, nor do we want to be Amazon, and, and there are some things that we like, and, and, and we do like, we're the kind of people who like doing business, looking somebody square in the eye and talking to a real life person, and all those things, right? And then the second question is about affiliates, and, and we talked about uh, the fragmentation of the industry here, and it says AQHA has affiliates across the country and around the world, and each one of those affiliates are organized differently and frankly enjoy different results. But what should AQHA do to, to maximize the results achieved and, and capitalize on the results achieved by meeting these affiliates? So, so how do we preserve our identity? How do we work with and, and utilize this transformation effort to, to, to capitalize and leverage uh, the good work of our affiliates? Yeah, I think one thing we want to do is never lose our legacy. There's been such great work by so many great people and great horses before us that um, that's paramount. And if that's a cornerstone and a foundation from which we grow upon, I think we're, we remain in a very good space. I think when we talk about the future and what we need to do in those partnerships with affiliates, I think of that from a technical perspective first and foremost. When you think of technology as a cornerstone, there's no reason for every um, equine industry or cattle industry to go out and buy the same technology that produces the same results. And I think that's when you can start aggregating businesses and aggregate them in a, in a fashion that you leverage the same technology to meet the needs of each of those businesses. I'm not saying you need to blend the businesses because frankly I love this organization and um, I don't want our legacy to be lost in any way, shape and form. But what I do is want us to be smart and effective and efficient. And through that process, it's leveraging technologies that can be leveraged across multiple industries that has zero impact on the legacy of our organization. I know I mentioned this last time I was with you, but I, I completed a strategic planning process for the National Swine Registry about a year ago right now. And, uh, and that is a, a group of people, as Craig knows quite well, uh, where four individual hog brigades came together and formed the National Swine Registry. Each one of them maintains its own board of directors. Um, they, in fact, the Yorkshires actually own the office that they're in, and uh, the Yorkshire board gets a, a rent payment uh, from uh, the other breeds for the use of that, that office. Uh, staff is employed by the National Swine Registry. So, so they, and this is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for many years, but I think anybody in the hog industry would tell you uh, that independently, uh, maybe one of those breed associations would have survived, certainly not all four of them. And by coming together, to your point, to, to say what can we do together that is in the, for the good of all of us, and what are the things that we need to maintain separate status for. International Genetic Solutions, same thing in the beef cattle industry. The Semitol breed has really taken a leadership role in that. So a lot of things are happening to say, uh, you know, we don't have to recreate the wheel. Let's, mm -hmm. let's conserve and utilize our hard-earned resources for the things that are really going to make a difference, not for those things that we can all benefit from. If right. We, if we Absolutely. Ima Maggie. Imagine that point in time where we are so ahead of the, of the curve in terms of supporting our youth that every breed organization let us help drive youth, 
participation with horses. I mean, and that would be through marketing programs because everybody's suffering from the lack of kids coming up and we could help in that way so much. Also, two of the biggest cable companies in the nation, one bought and is using the other's technology to deliver digital TV. That would never have happened 15 years ago. But because they see the efficiencies, the effectiveness of that platform, rather than build their own, they bought the other guys. And so these things are happening. We could provide fabulous um, IT services to other e industries and equine groups. I mean, the, the opportunities are endless if we can get our proverbial stuff together. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to try to keep us on, uh, on track. I'm going to ask one last question that came from the audience, and we're not going to get to them all. Um, but this is a great question. There are 250,000 plus AQHA members, maybe 1,000 are attending this conference and hearing about transformation. What should AQHA do to engage and invest those who are not present with these changes and the need for transformation? How do we, how do we take this and use these folks as the disciples? What can we do to engage all the rest? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that you have to do is really educate. And there are a few types of actions that you can take. If you think about a pyramid, um, you've got executive decisions on one side and then executive actions on the other. And executive decisions are more stroke of the pen. When you think about executive actions, it's um, engagement early and often at the very front end. And so the second component is building a coalition of support. And then the third is communicating early and often. I think that you have to aggregate those three items and have a very deliberate plan to push out the information through multiple vehicles, whether it's through video, whether it's through articles, there are tons of touch points. And frankly, I think we should be using our local affiliates as well. When we think of the clubs that we're all involved in, they should be communicating this message as well. They have a responsibility to grow our business as well. They have a responsibility to communicate effectively what we're doing, how we're doing it, and more importantly than anything, why we're doing it. Because we cannot do this alone. It has got to be all of us in and all of us pushing this message. Very good. Well, I think we heard a lot of good things today. We, we heard, at least from my perspective, that this burning platform and creating a burning platform is, is critically important, that, that change is not optional. I heard very clearly that, that you've got to create some real accountabilities, uh, that, that you've got to set some specific goals, that you've got to infuse your organization with diverse and innovative thinking, and that you've got to allow for some risk taking and some failure to take place, uh, but at the same time put the systems and processes in place to support those people so they can be successful. Um, I, I heard you talk about uh, the need for, for the customer experience and, and, and transform customer service to customer experience. And I also heard the, uh, the, the, the clear uh, discussion, Dan, that you've made several times, that, that at the end of the day, technology is the enabler. You can't just take a look at technology as the end-all, be-all. It's technology delivered through a set of people. Um, lastly, uh, the comment that I wrote down was that uh, we do have to maintain our history and heritage uh, while at the same time embracing the technology that allows this history and heritage to continue on into, into our next century. So um, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in giving each one of our panelists a big round of applause for their insights today while I give them a, a gift. Excellent, excellent perspective. I really appreciate that and I know you do too. And now, uh, bear with me for just a couple of minutes. I want to make a couple of closing comments. We've talked a lot today uh, about transformation and change. And uh, it doesn't happen over, overnight, it happens over time. And it requires an absolute commitment uh, by the people in this room to not only embrace that change, provide feedback like you've heard uh, Ralph and, and Dr. Hurd say today and, he, and, and Craig as well, but to also be out there and be engaged, just like we heard our panel say, to be real advocates and real disciples for this change and, and, and help other people across our industry embrace that change. Uh, I'll go back to one of the things Jeff Emmelt said. He, he, he said this, he said, one of the things I've said during every transformation 
is that we're on a 40-step journey. Go ahead and pop that up there. We're on a 40-step journey. Today, we're on step 22. I don't know exactly what step 32 looks like, but we're going to explore that together. And we will do whatever it takes to be successful. We are going to win. That's the point and, and, and really the takeaway I want you to walk out of this room with today. We are on a 40-step journey. And uh, you've seen some progress today, some great progress today. But we're not sure what step 32 looks like. But together, with the right kind of culture and the right kind of attitude, we're going to embrace that. We're going to commit to winning. And we will commit to figuring that out. So I want to ask you a couple more follow-up questions before we wrap up today. Polling is open now. Uh, with the limited people we have today, do you still have them or not? Hopefully some of you have them. Fantastic. Um, what do you believe will be the biggest barriers to implementing these changes within AQHA? Will it be the lack of support from AQHA members, the financial resources, the cultural changes necessary within the organization, the dissension that could occur between various functions or factions, um, the talent and the skill to actually execute the changes, or maybe something we've missed? What are going to be the biggest barriers to implementing and executing these changes? All in? Everybody in? One more? All right. <laughs> Let's see what you had to say. So, C, the cultural change necessary within the organization. I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's very accurate in any kind of transformation. It's, it's not the financial resources. People a lot of times want to want to call it that. Um, it, it's not the, the, the fact that we don't have the talent or skill to do it. It is the cultural willpower, the, the, the personality and attitude of an organization and its members to actually embrace it and to make it happen and, and to stick with it. Second question. What do you perceive to be the biggest payoff or the benefit to transformational changes being implemented by AQHA? Is it improved member service, an enhanced ability to market our organization? Is it a more efficient, profitable organization? The opportunity to create for increased collaboration with other equine organizations or industry partners? Or will it result in the attraction of new members into our organization and industry? What might you think will be the biggest benefit of the transformational change you heard talked about today. A couple of more from before. <clears throat> okay, now they're in it looks like. All right, let's see what you said. Okay, uh, a more diverse uh, setting, which I anticipated, but uh, 15 said, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the attraction of new members into our organization, improved member service, and a uh, more efficient, profitable organization. I bet you're hoping all of those are the case, right? Absolutely. So a couple of things that I want to leave you with. Keys to success, rewire your brain. You, you heard me comment on that earlier. I want you to read that quote. You must profoundly be convinced that the company must transform itself, that it's a matter of life or death. Because when you start the play, you're going to immediately get pushback. You guys identified that earlier in one of our questions. You got to change. Change is not optional, right? Um, the decision to embrace change is optional, but change is not optional. And, and, and secondly, I, I want to challenge Craig, his team, the executive committee, and everyone else to do this. Listen and act at the same time. One of the hardest challenges driving change is allowing new information to come in constantly and, and giving yourself the chance to adapt while still having the courage to act and push people forward. Even as you're making a major commitment, you got to be open to pivoting on the basis of what you learn because it's unlikely the strategy is perfect. Nothing we've ever done has turned out exactly as it began. That's good guidance. And having worked with a lot of different companies, a lot of different organizations over 26 years, I can tell you this that uh, you start out with a plan, but as my daughter likes to remind me, the reason there's 26 letters of the alphabet is when plan A doesn't work, you still have 24, 25 more options. And, 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 and the point is not that you shouldn't be committed to the first plan, the point is demonstrate a level of grace and forgiveness as you go through this process, recognizing that the heart and the values of your leaders 
are in the right place. They're trying to do what's right. They're trying to do what's best. They want to serve you better and recognize that, no, we don't have everything figured out just yet, but we're going to get things figured out. Give them that kind of support. The last thing I want to share with you. Does anybody recognize this person? Mr. Seekins, was that you? Fosbury. Ah, that was Dick Fosbury was the man's name. What did he create? The Fosbury Flop. Quick story, I'll abbreviate because we're short of time, but he was a sophomore in high school at Grants Pass, Oregon. He was struggling with a scissor kick style that takes the jumper over the bar one leg at a time. And as the bar got higher, he said he remembers leaning back more and more, making his back more parallel to the ground. Well, tragic coach Bernie Wagner from Oregon State University saw a little potential in this high jumper, and he offered him a scholarship to come to Oregon State. But when he got there, he asked him to try the Western roll, which was a more traditional style of high jumping. And he would try to use the Western roll in practice and take care of his coach, and then he would experiment with his Fosbury flop and meets, and he wasn't very good at, at either one of them. But he, he actually set an Oregon State University record, uh, a little over six foot, and uh, track coach Bernie Wagner began letting him flop full time. He perfected the flop and continued on, uh, ranking in the, the, the top 50. Fast forward to the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, Mexico. With a jump of seven foot, four and a quarter inches, Dick Fosbury set an Olympic and an American record and brought home the gold medal for the United States of America. I pulled this article many years ago, and so I don't know what the up-to-date statistics are, but at that point in time, 12 of the 14 gold medalists since that point in time had used the Fosbury flop. And here's why I tell it to the American Quarter Horse Association this afternoon. Folks, the bar is getting higher. You might think that with a more of a running start, lifting a few more weights, conditioning yourself better, you'll get over the bar. But fundamentally, I'm here to tell you the changes I see happening all across livestock species in all organizations, the fundamental economic shifts we've, ex we've experienced in, in, our, in our world and our society tell us that just trying to work harder is not going to cut it. We've got to find a different way over the bar. It's going to require a transformational change, isn't it, Craig? And guess what? You're not always successful with that transformational change. It can be uncomfortable. It can be difficult. But take a look at what Dick Fosbury did to the high jumping industry and what I have complete confidence the American Quarter Horse Association can do to the equine industry. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. There's very few organizations in beef cattle or horses that have the power, the resources, the talent, the mass market potential to make that kind of revolutionary change and that kind of impact. In the equine world, you're that organization. And so with that, I'm going to close today before I bring Craig up here by saying simply this. Change is coming. Cinch up and hang on. <laughs> How about a big round of applause for Kevin again? What a great friend, great friend of our industry, a great stockman, great family man. Thanks for making this interesting. Thanks you for what you do for our livestock industry and cattlemen and cattlemen and being a great leader and a great spokesperson. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you, my friend. We've got a little bit of a token here. You bet. Sir, you bet. He's one of the great ones. We want to thank you all for joining us today, staying hitched all afternoon on some technical conversation. I think uh, you all get it. You all understand where we're headed, and we, uh, we look forward to working with you on this journey of, of transforming AQHA. Thanks so much.